Welcome, Pastors. I want to be talking about uh, some of the most important things uh, in regard to the church health uh, and implementing the purpose-driven church strategy. As we talk about this, it's always good to go back to the basics in terms of asking what is a healthy church. And the answer to that is that a healthy church is a church that has a aggressive and clear communicated strategy about how to bring people in, how to build them up, in the faith, how to get them connected to their ministry, and how to send them out in mission trained. Bring people in, get them built up and strong in their faith, in their relationship with God. Get them involved in a ministry so that they are using their gift and send them out confidently with their commission uh, on mission for God. So when we do that, and put that into play. There are certain ways of doing that. There are methods. We use the class system. We use small groups. We use uh, methodologies. We use uh, in terms of preaching. But overall, I've taught over and again uh, the purpose-driven strategy. So I want to be able to just go over some of these things that uh, that we have been doing, and ask ourselves some questions and answer that as well. Some from my own experience. Some from what I've learned from others and uh, some from what you're saying. So please feel free to uh, fill in the comment below, ask questions, uh, anything that we could take this conversation further. But I want to keep asking you, are you a healthy church? Are you a healthy pastor? Are you taking your church in the direction of health, right? So uh, Nat's with me, and Natalia has been uh, involved with some of you in terms of communication and, uh, and asking questions. She often does some of the legwork and uh, maintains our relationship with you through email and uh, other ways she's making sure that we have the material whenever you need it so you could always uh, text and, uh, and and email and ask her and she'd mm -hmm. be happy to help you with that uh, Nat do you have any questions that pastors have asked so that I can answer yeah. that yeah well um, the number one question that I've actually received is um, how do we implement PD in a rural setting? Because we have a couple of examples of implementing <coughs> that in a general urban setting, yeah. right? So, yeah. and I know that it is not an English or a Hindi based, a language based model. Yeah, it is not a language based model. It's biblical principles that are transferable. So therefore, no, it is not either Western or Indian. It's not rural or city, but if you go back to what I was just saying before as we started, it is that process, which means we have to look at the context of how we make that process happen. In a more rural, uh, urban setting, you could have classes, you could have notebooks and, and, and signing things and you know uh, graphics and PowerPoint and things like that. And that may not all be available in the rural setup. So the question that needs to be, needs to be answered is, what is vital mm -hmm. to moving people forward? And in the rural setup, it is more relational. It is more, uh, more through stories and through uh, people uh, hand-holding, through people taking us through that process. So we have to go back and ask, who are the people who are designated to invite people to church, to help them to grow, to help them to get involved in ministry, to help them to go out on mission? So rather than using classes or material or education, we use relationships and coaches so the key word would become who is your partner or your coach who's the person who's helping you move to the next mm -hmm. step so we have people that are very clearly defined in their ministry to the membership uh, getting people into membership through to the maturity getting people to grow to the ministry you get the idea so you get people involved in moving people in the urban setup you may put up a powerpoint you may say come to class you may say uh, take the next step you, you people will take the initiative to do it on their own they know what needs to be done you can give it to them in writing or in print and they will understand it but in the rural setup it's very heavily relational um, and it's also very communal the community goes through it together so in the in the rural urban setup we appeal to the individual but in the rural setup we appeal to a community so you ask the community to go through the whole so you may take the whole church through membership you may take the whole church through maturity. You may break it down and do it in small groups, smaller, you know, midweek uh, sangat, uh, sangeets or, or gatherings or any kind of fellowship situations. 
uh, you might do it like that. So the question really isn't how are you doing it? The question really is are you doing it? Are you moving people forward? Are more people joining your church? Are more people growing in the Lord? Are more people getting involved in ministry, finding their ministry, finding their shape? So the key thing is, is it happening? And if you don't know how to do it, then we can talk more to rural pastors and ask how are they implementing it? One of the side uh, helps I would say would be is to use pictorial uh, teaching. And we have that for you as well. If you write to us, we can send the pictorial teaching and the development of uh, the purpose-driven paradigm in pictures so you can teach that. So for the purpose-driven life individually as well as for pastors who are trying to teach their whole church. Uh, that. So I think that that should be a help. Mm -hmm. um, another question that has come up is, because um, we're talking about a process, right? So um, a couple of pastors, church leaders have asked, um, how, how long do I have to wait for new members to be a part of the ministry team? Because some of them have been to churches, they've just mm. come to a new city and are joining churches. Some yeah. are brand new believers. So yeah. what level of discernment or how much yeah. time do we need for yeah. that? The first and foremost way of looking at it is assuming that you are actually bringing a new believer to Christ. So for the most part, we should be thinking about bringing new believers to Christ. So if that's the case, which is what the majority should be, as a new believer comes in, you need that time to develop it. Get in and then get healthy. And get healthy and then get strong. So we need to work through that process. You don't want to put an unhealthy person, an uns, um, perhaps even an unsafe person, or a person who's not sure about uh, the deity of Christ, the exclusivity of Christ, the uh, atonement, things like that. You're not, uh, they're not grounded in their faith. They're still going through some serious questions about uh, their own brokenness, uh, sinfulness versus sainthood, etc., etc. There are some uh, issues people have. Get them through that, strengthen their faith, and then get them involved in ministry. However, that said, there are also those who come in from outside. They come in from another church. I like the, the New Testament model of a letter of recommendation. The letter of recommendation basically says that a, a pastor or elder from the other church tells you, yes, they are good. They are involved. They've been serving. They've baptized. You know, they've been in communion. They've been walking with Christ. And they, they'd be happy to recommend them to a ministry in your church. In which case, grandfather them through the process, push them quickly through the process, and make sure that they are in agreement with you, in line with your theology, in line with your church. Then also make sure that they understand what the purpose-driven paradigm is moving towards, why we are doing what we are doing. And thirdly, get them involved in ministry. Don't just assume that because they're believers, they will agree with everything you're saying. Mm -hmm. I know the best of believers who have not agreed with me more than 50% of what uh, we talk about in the purpose-driven uh, paradigm. So it is important for them to be on board. And therefore, they go through the membership class and they go through uh, the ministry training and then get involved. Perhaps a little faster than how you would normally do it with the others, but you can move them along quicker. For the most part, I would, I would, I would be more cautious to send everybody through the process. If I was joining a church and I was already familiar with ministry, I, I would love to learn how you do things. I would love to take my time and, and, and take it slow. I would recognize that you are serious about ministry. So I wouldn't have a problem with it. So I don't think anybody else should. If they do have a problem, then they have an ego issue, in which case they shouldn't be involved in ministry. Of course, the task processes and people. Yes, yes. That, that's a great way to test people. So we put them through tasks. If they're faithful, then we put them, we give them processes. That's a little bit more commitment, a little bit more dependability. And then if they're faithful for that, then we give you our greatest asset, which is people. I'll talk about this a little later sometime when we'll really get into it. But tasks, processes, and people are a great way to move people even within uh, ministry to greater depths of, uh, of commitment. You don't want them diving straight into uh, people's lives and messing up anybody's life. We want to be careful about that, you know. Another question that has come up uh, a couple of times is how does accountability work with lay people? Yeah, that's always a problem because at the workplace you're paid and uh, in families there's a relationship, uh, there's authority in the family. Even in teams, even on sports teams, 
there's clear roles and allegiance and, and authority. In churches, somehow or the other, people struggle with that. Mm-hmm. But you know what? If society and God and community calls for for being organized and hierarchy and laws and and then more than any other place in the church subordination humility submission should be more seen so i don't think it's out of the normal to have a set up accountability system where either your small group leader or your ministry leader has been given authority. And here's something we don't do. Pastors don't sense and act in authority. And that is pilfered down into all the other ministries where nobody feels authorized to make any decisions. So everybody's passing it up back to the pastor. And the pastor is incumbent on a team or an elder or some committee to make the final decision. He mm-hmm. can't even make the decision himself. Mm-hmm. Now you have to make up your mind about that, of how you want to figure that problem out. But accountability process must be there. Because if you're doing the work of God and you're working in a ministry, then God's purposes are at stake. And in which case, in that case, there needs to be accountability. You can't just do whatever you want to do, not do anything you don't want to do, feel like it, don't feel like it, show up, don't show up, and then fall under an umbrella of grace and say grace should be applied in church. We should all be gracious towards one another. You can't hold each other accountable. You can't fire. You can't reassign. That is just not taking ministry seriously. So if we really want to take ministry seriously, want to see people respect church and serving in church, then I think accountability needs to be put into place. It doesn't even matter what I think. The fact is that Jesus said, go into all the world. Jesus said, don't follow me if you're going to look back. Jesus said, you foolish servant, when you knew that I would hold you accountable for five talents, for two talents, how could you go and bury your one talent? When Jesus has put forward a clear accountability structure and called himself Lord and taken and and, and accepted our allegiance, as uh, subordinates, then who are we to kind of question that and work around that? That's what I think. And I think when we do apply it, there will be some ruffle feathers. Yeah. There will be a few people who will buck that Absolutely. because they want church to be uh, free for all. Uh, but eventually you will be left with those who submit to the system and, and, and they give in. It's not a place where you can turn into a control atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not for you know, some control freak or some very powerful pastor to kind of control everything and make sure that it's done its way. That is also unhealthy. But it is helpful for everyone to know that they are reporting that they are accountable to somebody for the work that has been given to them. Otherwise, it just never gets done, you know. I, I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that and how your experience has been in this uh, this area as well. 